that have looked at it. Um, and you can see that in uh, some of the newer studies, um, you can see at least half, almost up to two thirds of patients with opioid use disorders also meeting criteria for chronic pain, right? So the, the take home point here is that if we're working with someone with opioid use disorders, uh, we should be on the lookout for um, any chronic pain that might coexist. Um, and this is the this study that showed a 64% prevalence of chronic pain amongst patients with opioid use disorder. So let's take a magnifying lens and zoom in on that a little bit. So what this study did is that it was a you know opioid use disorders clinic uh, in California, and they uh, looked at over 5,000 adults who saw treatment over about a 10 year period for their opioid use disorders. Uh, so they looked at them and they tracked them. Uh, they asked them about chronic pain, they screened them for chronic pain, they tracked them. And you can see that, you know, it was only about a third who had no chronic pain over, you know, um, in, in, this, in this sample you know, for a majority. So, well, not a majority, but the most common scenario in about 40% of patients, when they saw treatment for opioid use disorder, chronic pain was already there. And the researchers were really able to say that it was the chronic pain that came first and preceded the development of opioid use disorder. For another about 15%, both were present uh, at presentation and they couldn't really determine what had come first, the chronic pain or the opioid use disorder. And then for about 10%, the opioid use was there and then chronic pain developed later. So still a vast majority of patients with opioid use disorder um, had uh, chronic pain. And the relationship was bidirectional with pain most frequently preceding opioid use disorder diagnosis. And those people, this 40% who had chronic pain before the onset of opioid use disorder also had higher rates of mental illnesses, other health conditions. And patients who had th this group that had opioid use disorder first, about 10% of these 5,000 patients uh, tended to have other substance use disorders uh, along with things like HIV and hepatitis C. So they probably had more severe substance use disorders, right? So key point there being that this is not uncommon. Um, pain and opioid use disorders often coexist. So we should be aware and we should be thinking about ways to manage it. So I'm going to now go right into how do you manage acute pain in someone with opioid use disorder who might be on medications for opioid use disorder? Um, just an acknowledgement and, um, and I want to say thank you to PCSS Providers Clinical Support System, who have allowed me to use uh, some of their slides on um, management of acute pain in the emergency department settings that I really include as reference. I won't go into those slides in too much detail in the interest of time, but they are there for reference. Um, and this is public domain art by people who have consented to it and they've made their art public, um, you know, of someone experiencing pain. I'll start with a vignette. Um, again, all details here are changed, but it is based on something I, I saw when I was a fellow, actually, and has sort of stayed with me um, over a decade later. Anne is a 45-year-old female who was recently had a shoulder surgery, has a history of opioid use disorder, and previously has a history of being treated with methadone on two separate occasions. Both times did well while on methadone, but then stopped the methadone and returned to illicit opioids soon after. And right before this surgery, she was using half a gram of heroin two or three times a day via smoking. And now after the surgery, she's on mor morphine continuous infusion, 4.2 milligrams per hour. Plus she can request an additional 10 milligrams IV every four hours for breakthrough pain. She last used that IV uh, PRN dose two hours ago. So still has two more hours to go, but she's requesting more pain medication. She reports her pain is nine out of 10. She's crying, she's in tears, her vital signs are stable. Uh, when I get to the unit, I'm informed, quote, she's drug seeking. She's already getting more pain meds than any other patient on the unit. She does not need more. Besides, she's an addict and we don't want to worsen her addiction. So let's keep this patient AN in mind as we go over the next few slides here. Some commonly held beliefs to provide the background on it. We know that acute pain in general is frequently treated uh, in inpatient settings. And it's been reported, although there is no good data that I've seen at least, that this under treatment of acute pain might be even more so in patients with a history of addiction, substance use disorders. It's been shown that you know, 
healthcare providers, healthcare professionals, clinicians are not immune from stigma toward individuals with substance use disorders. In fact, they are they fairly commonly hold stigmatizing attitudes, uh, such as it being a social problem requiring law enforcement rather than a health problem requiring prevention and treatment. So there's this perceived controllability that why can't this person just control uh, this substance use disorder, which can lead to blame, right? And patients with substance use disorders by other by clinicians are often seen as manipulative or deceptive. So these are the attitudes that are out there. And I think they do impact how patient, our patients are treated, uh, sometimes unfortunately in acute pain scenarios. So this is a suggested approach. We start by accepting the patient's self-reported pain. Um, you know, something that um, one, one preceptor I had once told me many years ago was, you know, if you're not going to trust or believe your patient, who are you going to believe? And I kind of try to hold that pretty close to um, my clinical practice and let that inform my clinical practice. Uh, we start by accepting the patient's self-reported pain. We recognize that pain behaviors vary widely, right? And vital signs, while important by themselves, are not a very reliable indicator of pain intensity. Someone's vital signs can be stable, such as our patient, and they can still be in quite a bit of pain. So we start with that. Yes, the patient is reporting pain by accepting that. And then we do some introspection. Uh, we look at the chart, we see the bigger scenario, look at the clinical picture, and ask ourselves, what could be going on? Certainly, it could be addiction, right? Addiction or substance use disorder, which is a chronic brain condition, um, you know, where the person comes to see the substance that they're addicted to as being not just important, but even necessary for survival. Um, and they may have things like cravings and consequences and continued use despite those consequences and compulsive use. We also consider the possibility of pseudo addiction which is admittedly a controversial term that arose out of um, kind of cancer literature back in the 80s. And the idea is that someone is displaying some of these behaviors that on the surface may suggest addiction, but it's really happening because their pain is undertreated, right? So if someone's dosed with, um, I don't know, hydrocodone five milligrams once a day, maybe they're asking for more medications. They're saying they're in a lot of pain. They're getting angry. They're getting irritable but it's really because their pain is inadequately controlled. Um, as you go up on the dose, if it is indeed pseudo addiction, their functioning should improve as the pain is better treated. Some of those concerning things that the staff are seeing should dissipate. On the other hand, in a case of addiction, in a case of true substance use disorder, simply increasing the dose is not going to improve functioning. In fact, the functioning may continue to deteriorate. And the last thing to consider, and this can often coexist, right? That's the other thing, is the possibility of physiologic dependence, that the person's body is used to a substance, and that's what's driving some of the things we're seeing. Because they're not getting it at the same level, so they're experiencing withdrawals. It's also recommended that in, this is acute pain, remember, it's a very different process in someone with chronic pain, but in acute pain, do not withhold opioid analgesics from people with addictions. There's really no or little data showing that acute pain management is going to worsen that substance use disorder. But untreated pain, undertreated pain can lead to cravings and potential, potentially a risk of relapse. Not a whole lot of data on it, but there are a couple of studies of patients on methadone maintenance treatment, that's the MMT, showing that opioid analgesia for acute pain did not increase their chances of relapse. So we don't have a lot of data, but the data that's there says that we don't just blindly treat with opioids. Of course, we think about all the possibilities, look at the wide clinical picture, but if necessary, we go ahead and treat that acute pain. Also keep in mind that our patients with tolerance, such as the patient in the vignette, have higher dose, may need higher doses of opioids more so than other patients because of that physiologic dependence that exists, right? Their bodies are just used to, they're tolerant to receiving higher doses of um, opioids. Also remember, that opioid agonist treatment, such as treatment with methadone or buprenorphine that the patient may be receiving, is only treating that baseline addiction. It is not going to treat acute pain. I still get these calls on the PALS line probably once every couple of months that this patient is in the ER, um, they're in acute pain, but the patient is on 70 or 80 milligrams daily of methadone. Should not that be enough 
to also treat their pain? And my answer is no, again, that's just their baseline tolerance that's keeping them from returning illicit opioids. But if there's an acute pain generator, um, you know, by itself, the baseline dose is not going to treat that. So important to keep in mind. The next three slides are courtesy of providers clinical support system for any ED providers that may be there. And this is really an evolving approach that if a patient who's on medications for opioid use disorder shows up in the emergency department for acute pain, how do we proceed? And this here um, is a good little algorithm. You continue the maintenance dose, whether it's buprenorphine or methadone, but you generally want to divide the dose up uh, into four to six hours dosing. I think it does a couple of things. One is that when the dose is divided, it provides better analgesia than when, the, when the, someone is dosed once a day. And second, especially with methadone, if you can't, cannot verify the dose, then splitting it up is also going to add to safety. So for example, say I wind up in the ER and I see Dr. Hager and I say, hey, I'm on 120 milligrams daily of methadone and I haven't dosed today. Dr. Hager calls the opioid treatment program. Maybe the clinic is closed. Maybe it's after hours. The dose cannot be verified. If instead of giving me 120 all at once, splits that up into 30 milligrams four times, then it's also safer in addition to providing analgesia. Right? So we want to continue that um, dose. Then second is we want to maximize, just like we would with chronic pain, all of our non-opioid strategies, including comfort measures, right? And rest, ice, compression, elevation, those things that we do. Uh, and medications that are alternatives to opioids, including things like trigger point injections, right? Local anesthetics, acetaminophen and NSAIDs, gabapentinoids, and even consider things like regional nerve blocks uh, or hematoma blocks, or even things like our um, um, you know, alpha-2 agonists or ketamine. Uh, and really reserving the opioids if the pain remains poorly controlled, even after trying all of those non-opioid measures. And very often, the thing that comes in handy if additional opioids are required, I'm going to go forward. This is still looking at some of the non-opioid modalities, including subdissociative ketamine, including our alpha-2 agonists such as clonidine or dexmedetomidine, uh, which can be quite important adjuncts, right? But if those opioids are needed, right, then very often the two that are used in our anesthesiologists are quite you know, skilled at using them are fentanyl and hydromorphone. Fentanyl, while it's of course a major driver of overdose mortalities through its illicit forms and illicit use, in a setting of acute pain in a medically monitored setting can actually be a great tool because fentanyl can be titrated in very gradual increments. It's also short acting. So you can really titrate that to effect for additional analgesia uh, in a very uh, precise manner. Uh, so fentanyl and to a lesser extent hydromorphone often wind up being used. Uh, option two, if someone is on buprenorphine, increasing the dose is an option. Occasionally IV bup is also utilized, though in my experiences it's not on formulary uh, in many emergency departments. So this is generally the approach that is taken. What about methadone? So say someone is in the, there is acute pain, they're maintained on methadone, again, Verify the dose, continue the baseline methadone. These are kind of the best practices. If dose cannot be verified, as we already talked about, split it up into three or four times a day of dosing. And then if needed, add in short-acting opioids for breakthrough pain. You can also in gradually increase methadone dose, right? But this gets tricky because if you're going to increase the methadone dose, then prior to the patient returning to their opioid treatment program, the opioid treatment program may say, hey, can you get the patient down to their usual dose before we pick them up, which can make that dispo uh, a little bit tougher, right? So in some ways, uh, it may be easier uh, practically um, just to you know, split that methadone, baseline methadone dose up and then add in short-acting opioids. Um, don't administer buprenorphine if they're on methadone because that can lead to precipitated withdrawals. If patients are unable to tolerate oral methadone, IV methadone can be used, but you have to be very careful there because the dosing is different. In general, with IV methadone, the dose is reduced by one half to even up to two thirds. So the dose is reduced quite a bit. And again, it's divided up into six to times uh, day dosing, 
right? And keep in mind that methadone for analgesia requires multiple times a day dosing and can be prescribed by any clinician with a Schedule II license. Now, if the patient is on buprenorphine, how do you manage pain acutely? Again, as we already talked about in that little algorithm, employ all non-opioid modalities first. Maximize them, just like we would with methadone as well, right? We don't want to forget about those. Then the first thing that we wind up doing is adjusting the buprenorphine dosing interval. We make it more frequent, and sometimes we also go up on the dose. So I'll use an example. I recently had a patient was maintained on 12 milligrams daily of buprenorphine, had been doing really well, had a major dental procedure, um, and, and she was in acute pain. We got her consent, talked to the dentist. Um, and afterwards, what we did was, instead of the 12 milligrams, we changed her dosing up to four milligrams four times a day. So I split it up and I temporarily increased the dose of buprenorphine. We also added in some acetaminophen and that was perfect. That controlled her pain well. And once that acute pain need was no longer there, then we went back to our usual dose of buprenorphine and stopped the acetaminophen. And that often works well, right? Uh, in an ER setting, again, ibuprenorphine is an option. Sometimes you can also, in cases of major surgeries, major pain, you can augment that buprenorphine with short-acting opioids uh, with high mu receptor binding affinity. In ER settings, again, it's often things like uh, fentanyl or uh, dilaudid, um, and certainly worthwhile to consider an addiction medicine expert um, if any other help can be provided. Perioperatively, for patients on buprenorphine, this is the conflict, right? This is the tension where patients fear mistreatment and providers fear deception. So if I am the outpatient provider, if I'm the outpatient clinician taking care of this patient, then ethically, medically, I must advocate for them. I must help come up with a good plan to ensure that the patient's pain perioperatively is going to be optimally treated, it's going to be effective, and it's going to be safe. So I think one of the key points is that important to tell off all of our patients as part of their treatment agreement, part of the consent process, that if you're ever going to have a procedure, even if it feels minor, let us know as soon as you find out so we can make sure that your pain will be safely and effectively treated. And as soon as you find out, get consents and start a conversation, right? Uh, with surgeons, uh, with the primary care providers to come up with a unified plan. It's tricky because there is a lack of consensus in the field. And it's also going to depend on uh, how much experience someone has, a surgeon has, with uh, managing patients who may be on buprenorphine. Historically, what used to happen, and this still comes up, I recently had a patient that some of you guys from ASAP might remember who was a surgery. And their surgeon said, told the patient to stop the buprenorphine, I think a week or two before the procedure. And the patient was scared. They were freaking out. What am I going to do for that week or two after my buprenorphine stops? I'm going to be withdrawing. What do I do? How do I manage it? That's kind of drastic, uh, right? And doesn't usually come up, but historically it was very common for surgeons um, to tell the patients to stop their buprenorphine about three days before the procedure to open up all those mu opioid receptors and perioperative pain is treated using full mu agonists as usual then those are discontinued and buprenorphine is restarted. I can tell you that most of my patients are scared of that because they know that they're going to have those periods and withdrawals and that's high risk, right? That those are times where they can return to illicit opioids simply to treat their withdrawals. So really over the last four years, we gradually moved away uh, from those strategies, right? In general, what we say for most procedures, buprenorphine should not be discontinued. Current evidence really does not support the practice of routinely discontinuing buprenorphine before the surgery. If someone's on high doses of buprenorphine, we might occasionally bring that down to 16 or 12 milligrams to again open up some mu opioid receptors, but buprenorphine can often um, stay on board perioperatively in all except the most major procedures, right? And this was the original editorial by Anna Lamke out of Stanford back in 2018 that really highlighted this approach. Patients maintained on buprenorphine for opioid use disorder should continue buprenorphine through the perioperative period, right? So how is it managed? So the patient's on buprenorphine, and then again, we take that stepwise approach. 
right? Using our altos, our alternatives to opioids first. So things like maybe you do a epidural and run a local anesthetic through it, right? Maybe you use our alpha-2 agonists, or maybe we use ketamine at sub-anesthetic doses. And if opioids are required, then again, very often it's going to be those opioids with um, high mu affinity, such as fentanyl or dilaudid, that can be titrated precisely. And post-operative, the buprenorphine is already there. So you wind up maximizing it, right? You maximize the buprenorphine, split it up into three or four times a day dosing, and then augment uh, with acetaminophen, with NSAIDs as needed to get additional analgesia. Yeah. So that's often the approach that's taken. But it's critical to come up with a plan ahead of time, if at all possible. So everyone's on the same page. The patient knows what to expect because that's also going to decrease some of the anticipatory anxiety um, that understandably they may otherwise have. What about naltrexone? Naltrexone is tricky because of that strong mu opioid blockade it provides. I actually tell all of my patients who are on Vivitrol to carry a medical alert card, something in their wallet, something in their purse that says, hey, I'm on naltrexone. What I say is hopefully you'll never need it, but in case there is something that happens, you need pain management, you'll surely be glad that it's there to alert the first responder. And then in case of acute pain, multimodal analgesia is the name of the game if someone's on naltrexone. If it's an elective procedure, what I tell someone is that if they're taking oral naltrexone, the last dose should be at least 72 hours or three days before the planned procedure. And if they're getting the Vivitrol injection, the long-acting injectable naltrexone, then the last injection should be four weeks prior to the planned procedure. These are just some reference slides. This is, we already talked about this, kind of lays out the approach along with, um, you know, this is another way of doing that. Uh, some of the non-opioid pharmacologic agents that are often utilized uh, in acute pain settings and inpatient or ER units. And you can see there are many of them, right? So I've listed those as well. This is multimodal pain uh, management, which is done certainly uh, in cases of acute pain or emergent surgery in patients on naltrexone. Um, and very similar to this, right? So this just kind of lists some of the dosing, et cetera, mechanisms of action. So that's there for reference. So with that, I'm going to go into, we don't have a case, so I'm going a little bit longer. I'm taking a little bit more, uh, and, a little bit and, more time. Mm -hmm. I did, sorry to interrupt for one yes. second. Um, Flavio, just chat in if you plan to present today. Okay. Go ahead, Dr. Bot. Sorry. Great. So we have a presentation. Sorry. Yes, we do. I, um, I was sent a form. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. So I will go pretty quickly here through the chronic pain management. I want to leave time for, um, you know, for, for the case. So I'm going to go fairly quickly here. Chronic pain management, I think one of the things I want to highlight is that approach is very different. We know that patients who have opioid use disorders are at a very high risk, maybe a disproportionately high risk for misusing prescribed opioids, right? So in general, we want to use uh, consult a pain management specialist, use the multidisciplinary team approach, and really optimize right, all of our non-opioid medications. Some of those are listed here, right? And there are many of them that are evidence-based. Uh, or, and along with our non-pharmacological therapies. And some of them are evidence-based or evidence-guided. CBT for pain, for example, things like physical therapy. So we really want to optimize them. And if opioids must be prescribed, we want to provide really careful monitoring. And this is actually another talk that we just did recently. Um, and we will again, um, you know, as part of um, responsible opioid prescribing, um, and this is particularly important um, in treating chronic pain in patients with a history of opioid use disorders. A couple of things. For most patients, I want to just draw attention here, uh, with chronic pain and opioid use disorder, opioid abuse, opioid dependence, use older terminology, um, buprenorphine can be really important in targeting both opioid, opioid use disorder as well as chronic pain. And this is something we do a lot. It's certainly a whole lot safer. It can help pain in many patients, right? And there is maybe some suggestion that it can mitigate opioid-induced hyperalgesia, which is that central sensitization that happens when someone's chronically been on opioids. So buprenorphine is a great tool. Again, some reference slides here that talk about why buprenorphine might be a good option 
as a first line analgesic, right? This is an interesting study. So this was a study was out of California. At this point, it's about seven years old, uh, where they took patients, uh, but it's dramatic, so I've included it. So in the, all of these patients are on with patients with chronic pain, receiving very, very high doses of opioids for analgesia, usually on multiple opioid medications. And this is looking at morphine milligram equivalents. So you can see that all of them are on very high morphine milligram equivalents, right? Some of them at over 1,000. And this bar is looking at their visual analog pain rating from 1 to 10. The higher the, higher the score, the more pain, self-reported pain they're experiencing on a scale of 1 to 10. So despite taking these very high doses of opioids, these patients were all reporting pretty good amount of pain. And then what the clinic did was they discontinued all the opioids and switched them over to buprenorphine monotherapy. And three months later, they asked them again what their self-reported pain level was. And you can see that in all of these, the self-reported pain on that visual analog scale dropped significantly, both statistically, but also clinically, right? Even for the patients who are on the highest doses of opioids. Uh, and certainly if they were only on buprenorphine instead of like fentanyl and hydrocodone and whatever else, things were a lot safer. Uh, so this really highlights it. The buprenorphine, something to consider. For patients, if you're going to use buprenorphine just for chronic pain without that opioid use disorder, don't forget about the buprenorphine patch along with the buccal formulation that's been approved uh, for chronic pain management. Then lastly, there is a subgroup of people whose chronic pain is so severe in conjunction with their opioid use disorder. These are usually patients in my experience who have end of life pain, cancer related pain. Uh, the pain is just so severe that buprenorphine is just not going to cut it. And I think that's the subset of patients where I think about using methadone to target both the chronic pain and the opioid use disorder. I'm not going over the vignette, but this vignette is essentially a patient who had a long history of opioid use disorder, was using street heroin, wound up getting diagnosed with advanced carcinoma. So we wound up really coordinating with oncology palliative care. And through our opioid treatment program, we started her on methadone and maintained it while the oncologist and the palliative care team managed short acting opioids. And with that combination, her pain was well controlled, her opioid use disorder was well controlled, and the patient did quite well uh, for the remainder of her life. Um, she was with us. And finally, patients who have a history of chronic pain, naltrexone probably is best be avoided if the pain is severe enough to require opioids. Again, for most patients, think about buprenorphine. For a small subset, think about methadone. I will end here. I've got some references. Of course, the slides will be available here. Uh, so I will stop here so we can leave lots of time for the case discussion. Thank you.